as a capstone to all the conversations we've had so far, um, we are lucky now to have two of two people who I think are the smartest, some of the smartest critical voices in their respective fields. Uh, people who use their art to reject easy answers and advance a range of critical questions. What and, uh, what Frankfurt School nerds like me uh, used to call a negative dialectic, uh, but for a, a digital age. Uh, you may know Astra Taylor from her documentary films, which include Zizek and Examined Life. You may know her work as an activist. She's been in, involved in the Occupy Wall Street stuff in a project called Strike Debt, which deals with educational loans in an economic justice context. You may have seen her touring as an auxiliary member of Neutral Milk Hotel, or you may know her work as a writer. Uh, her book, The People's Platform, is one of the best, most balanced, comprehensive, and honest works about the internet I've read, uh, because it asks us to take the dem democratizing potential of the internet seriously, but also not take all its utopian claims at face value. And that allows us to catapult past the really silly, one-dimensional questions. Of, is the internet good or bad for musicians or journalism or independent culture? And rather envision what it would actually take to achieve cultural democracy. And Katie Greer is a singer and a lyricist in a punk band called Priests here in DC. Uh, with her bandmates, she runs the record label Sister Polygon, releasing cassettes and seven inch records and following in the tradition of all the great eclectic independent labels that define the contours of a community uh, while elevating marginalized voices. Again, cultural democracy. Um, the band's most recent record is called Bodies and Control and Money and Power, uh, co-released with Don Giovanni Records. Uh, she'll be going out on tours uh, shortly, opening for the Dismemberment Plan and Deerhoof this fall. Uh, please welcome me in joining Katie and Astra to the stage. Thank you, Kevin. We were both just talking backstage about um, how thrilled we are to be here and uh, I think we're both here because of Kevin inviting us. Yeah, and Kevin was someone who I, I just knew him from his Twitter handle. As I was working on this book, I started working on it seriously in 2010, and I was kind of, I felt like I was on my own lonely, I hope not too curmudgeonly, little island. Um, but I would find these people who I, I would agree with them on the internet, and he, he, you were one of them. I didn't know who you were, but I took solace in things that you tweeted out, so... Anyway, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I found, I, I heard of your band on Twitter too, actually. Cool. A few months ago. And I'm, I was new, really happy. I'm new to uh, Twitter world within the past. It brings us together. A couple months, but yeah, now we're, now we're Twitter friends. Well, one, so. thing, one thing, okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna moderate and have our own conversation. But one thing we both have in our titles, and I think it's actually really interesting, is the word power. You're right. And I feel like that's something for me that I wanted to bring into the whole conversation about the internet and the democratizing potential of technology. And I'm wondering, um, and, and that also it spoke to me as an activist too, because I feel like, um, you know, I come from, uh, I come out of working with Occupy Wall Street, as Kevin said, and Strike Debt, and I do this project called the Rolling Jubilee, where we buy and abolish debts on the secondary market. So we've uh, erased $20 million worth of people's medical and educational debts. Um, but it comes out of this consensus model of kind of prefigurative politics around this on the side, building your culture, your subculture, or building your utopia. And I, I kind of wanted to push my comrades a bit to be like, well, we actually need to think about power and taking power. And I was thinking about that too in, in, in the context of the internet, you know, even though we can all speak who has the power. Um, and this, who does it this serve? all relates to what we were actually talking about backstage just now. Um, we, were, we were listening to this panel going on about net neutrality and just talking about how net neutrality isn't enough. It's not enough that we all have access to um, these resources, or at least they're being presented to us as resources. Um, it's a matter of then figuring out where we want to take power from um, and how that affects the work that we're doing. How, why, why, how does that word, like how did that word end up in your album title? I'm just curious, or what made you? I find, um, Power dynamics, power relations are like a constant theme in work that I'm doing these days and just figuring out like, okay, who has the upper hand in this particular conversation? Um, how is that guiding, how is that guiding the process of things? How is that uh, disenfranchising certain voices? Um, and who is that benefiting at the end of the day? Um, so, 
that the, our, the title of our record is actually a nod to something that Barbara Kruger said in an interview. Like someone had asked her what her work was about and, and that was her response. Like I just make all of my art about bodies and control and money and power. And I was like, wow, what a concise way of putting it. Cause that's what all, all my work is about too. Um, and it seems like that's a lot of what you do yeah. as well in different capacities. Yeah, I mean, I think what you said about, um, yeah, I totally, I, I, I love that quote. And I think, I think what you were pointing out about Nit and Charlie is really right. I mean, the one, one thing I was responding to is the way that um, so much technology discourse got to the point of, okay, as long as we have net neutrality, we're, we're good to go. That's what we need to maintain a free and open internet and then sort of cultural democracy will flow and, and all of the assumptions about the internet being a kind of Robin Hood who would steal from the old legacy media rich and give to little guys or little girls like us kind of went un, unquestioned. Um, meanwhile, it was pretty apparent to me that all of these old hierarchies, all these old power dynamics were carrying over. So, you know, old economic hierarchies, the rich are getting richer. The Matthew effect is definitely at play. I mean, instead of, um, you know, there being multiple search engines around the world, there's Google that has 90% uh, of the market share in Europe and is obviously, a, you know, the most dominant engine here and that's sucking wealth to this one corner of the country, to Silicon Valley. So, and also gender hierarchies, we're seeing that, that there's, I have a chapter that deals a lot with, um, uh, gender dynamics online, and that's just an issue that just seems to be like flaring up and getting worse and worse and worse. Um, so yeah, looking at the way that these old power dynamics are actually being amplified online, and the issue of net neutrality is sort of a foundation, but it doesn't address address those problems. And you can have an open internet and still have still have the problems of the old legacy media model, which for me are consolidation, centralization, and commercialism. These are the things we used to criticize about the broadcast era, um, you know, and I was you know, very influenced by seeing Noam Chomsky's, Chomsky's Manufacturing Consent, the, the Canadian documentary as a teenager. I kind of wanted to be like, well, what, what does that media critique look like in a digital age? Or what does a Frankfurt school, school style critique look like in a digital age? So for me, even with an open net consolidation, you know, we have the return of vertical integration. Um, company like Netflix is a distributor and also making content, or Amazon wants to be the book in the bookshelf and the bookseller. It's also a web hoster and all this stuff. Um, there's yeah. a, there's a, a quote at the beginning of your book uh, that it's so succinct, but just about how these new models that we have are, are just replicating old models, like this new, this new radical supposedly radical structure or the way that things are realigning themselves actually looks the same as the way things looked before, which I think is so true. Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to read this quote from Astra's book. Um, it says, uh, across all types of media, product placement is on a massive upsurge, growing at a rate of 30% per year despite the recession and branded content or brand inspired content, as euphemists say, is all the rage. All told, the money poured into these last two markets exceeds $55 billion annually around the globe, with $25 billion spent in the United States alone. Conventional disclosure laws do not apply online or are simply impossible to enforce. This kind of stealth marketing has a corrosive effect on public discourse. Institutional integrity goes out the window when editorial content adapts to advertiser demands. And I think that that is a really important conversation to be having right now. Like, being a part of Twitter now, it makes me th uh, so aware of this idea of public discourse. You can really see conversations as they're happening, um, but you can't see as much what you're referring to with stealth marketing. And I'm just wondering, you, you do work in so many different capacities. How do you insulate yourself from, from power that you don't want while still finding uh, a way to expand your voice in what you're doing and like reaching more people. Yeah, I mean that's the promise of advertisers, right? Is they'll, they'll you kind of sign up with them and then they will, amp they will, they will expand your voice. They'll put their, their machine behind you. Um, and I, I'm a brat, you know, I want to be able to like reach an audience and do my work without having to partner with companies and causes I don't believe in. Same. I, 
thanks for reading a bit of my book. I wish I could sing Diet Coke to your song, <laughs> but that would suck. Um, no, I, I, but, I love, I love yeah. this book. It's like so, I would recommend it to everybody. Um, it's so excellent. It just covers so much ground and it, it raises so many big questions. I was talking to a friend of mine before this panel and he was like, yeah, I read that, that book earlier this year and like I was really inspired, but I also just like, it made me feel bad because I realized how bad things really are. And I think that's like, but that's, but that's a reality that people need to wake up to is that mm -hmm. um, as a creator, you maybe can, can feel completely connected to your audience or your potential audience now on the internet. Um, or maybe you see more opportunities for um, resources to create with, mm -hmm. but how are we ensuring that the work that we're creating isn't just an endless stream of advertisements right. for products? Right. How do we ensure that like art and, and the creation of culture remains um, idea exchange rather than um, product placement and like furthering uh, business venture capital? Yeah. Well, and the mythology of your generation and my generation is that we don't care about these things anymore, right? right. right. And I think it's important to say that, you know, we've acquiesced as a society to the corporate sponsorship model. I mean, that is the entire economy of the internet, which is advertising finance. And, you know, it's so retrograde. We have this amazing new communications platform, and yet we have this completely retrograde funding model. I mean, it's like the early days of television where soap operas sold soap. It's like, why can't we innovate? And that's because the economic aspects have not been disrupted. We haven't, if anything, we've shut down our mind to public options and, to other ways of supporting art and culture. Um, but I think that that idea is really pervasive, that we people don't care anymore. And that was one reason that I found, I think that your band struck me and that you're a voice out there saying, oh, no, we give a shit, you know? No, totally. Um, and I think, I think that that idea gets distorted because um, there are a, a number of people who care about this sort of thing tremendously but are trying to look at it from a really pragmatic angle of like, I want to make art, I want to create things, um, I need money in order to do that, I'm going to take money from whoever is offering it to me, um, which I can really understand because um, I work in a restaurant, that's where I spend most of my time, and I'm often wondering, like, I'm not, I'm not sitting in my restaurant wondering, like, how am I gonna become a famous star? I'm wondering how am I gonna live a life where I can actually get paid for the work that I want to create and not like waste away in this industry that I don't care about serving people food. Yeah, I think that's, and, and I think for too long the conversation has been focused on individuals and, or bands and the choices they've made in a lot of finger finger pointing instead of looking at the broader structure. Totally. And it's like you live in a society where you let the dog park be sponsored by Purina and where, you know, corporate sponsors get to name the auditoriums and stuff like that. So right. it's a structural problem and we kind of individualize it and demonize people. Um, totally. I think as individuals, one thing we can do though is invest in institutions and scenes and local bookstores and, you know, there are, there are things that we can build as artists that are not just about our personal work, but contribute to a sort of broader cultural ecology. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important aspect. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard... And I think that's one way that um, uh, discourse facilitated by the internet can, can work to your benefit is, is finding like-minded people mm -hmm. to, to create something larger than just your um, individual work and who you can bounce ideas off of uh, and try to try to work together so that you're not feeling um, totally isolated in your pursuits. Because you're right, if we, if we can find ways to invest in um, community-minded pursuits that we feel like we have a stake in mm -hmm. um, and can affect. Uh, can yeah. you talk about, I mean, I, I just read in a little piece that Kevin sent there was a show that you played that was sponsored by a corporate. Yes. Yes, and what did you do? Yes, uh, we played awesome. a show, it was around this time last year, um, for the, the, there's like a, a CMJ week every year in New York, um, which is kind of like an industry sort of thing. You take your band and you're supposed to like, you know, make a big scene and hopefully like, I don't know, 
get discovered, I guess, is, is what people are trying to do with that. A friend of ours uh, who, uh, a fr we know her, she writes for Pitchfork, invited us to come play um, one of their events, which was sponsored by Converse. Um, I think we got some shoes. Uh, we, yeah, we, we, we didn't know when we said yes that it was sponsored by Converse, but I don't think that, that would have changed our decision to play the show um, because we were reaching uh, more people participating in that event. And we actually like, it's something that like, I feel like we're turning into the burrito band sometimes because everyone's still asking about it. But like we made a funny joke and like threw burritos at people and were like, thank you for sponsoring the show Chipotle. Like, this is so great. <laughs> um, just to like make a joke about how all of these events and everything that we do is is underwritten by um, corporate money at this point. Yeah, I mean, every almost every stage you plan at a festival, there's like some big airline or there's some right. target sign. Or and something it's really like the that. it's really what I return to so much right now is like um, people who want to make work independently and aren't exclusively interested in just like making as much money as possible, but just making enough to sustain themselves and do their work. Um, if the community or industry or whatever you want to call it that we inhabit is so underwritten by these companies, um, how, how do we work outside of that without just like, like you said earlier, you kind of felt like a curmudgeon on an island or something writing your book. And I think a lot of times, if you're saying like, no, this is not okay with me, you find yourself in that position. Or when you're like, hey, this, is, this, this sucks. I don't really like the way things are. You'll find a lot of people like backing off because there's so much of this money is like, is supporting everything that we're doing. Yeah, I mean, I think there's lots of um, solace to be taken in historical lessons of people fighting for different kinds of reforms. I mean, the, reading even the history of broadcast media and looking at what it took to, to get our little pathetic version of public broadcasting in the United States was kind of heartening. I and mean, people had to be kind of these voices in the wilderness shouting like, a non-commercial option would be nice, and decades would go by and nobody would listen to that. Right. So um, those, are, those are kind of always my heroes in different domains, like people doing the unpopular thing. Um, but I think also just uh, underscoring what an inefficient model advertising is. I mean, and, and you see this, um, you know, basically the private tax, it comes out of that tax for $700 billion a year you know, economy, but ultimately consumers are paying for it, but then we have no say in what that tax is going to be put forth to pay for the political system. You know, it's just sort of recurring rather than going to go against. You can um, see that people are predictable populations based on race and, um, you know, are basically being redlined because cr lo uh, lenders can infer things that they wouldn't be able to just ask directly on a credit report. So there are all of these negative social costs of advertising, too. It's not just like an aesthetic, it's There's just I'm, an aesthetic problem. I hope I'm not embarrassing you. I just want to read one more uh, quote from your book at the end of this chapter, advertising after all doesn't feed or house us or educate us or enlighten us or make our lives better or more beautiful. Instead, advertising makes our culture less spirited and fearless, more servile and uninspired. Surely all that money could be better spent producing something we actually care about. I always think of, um, I read this years ago in an old issue of The Baffler, I think, um, I believe it's in Singapore? It's, um, there's a, a country referenced in this, in this essay talking about how um, so little uh, 
investment has been made in the arts in this culture that like um, there's a national newspaper there that finally axed its arts and entertainment section and replaced it with um, a column on business management theory and how mm -hmm. um, I think the author was just talking about how like that's totally a direction that we're working in in this country too. Like people just see the arts as this superfluous um, entertainment pastime at best. It's like a recreation, but um, it's actually such a vital uh, role in society for for exploring ideas and um, entertaining new ideas about reform, I think, that aren't necessarily finding a direct path um, in policy or something else. Right, and that's part of the threat of having it be robust and independent, is that the arts, you know, should be threatening and shouldn't be having to answer to, to um, the dictates of merchandising or whatever. And totally. how do you how do you foster that independence? And there's an idea, you know, that basically, you know, I, I quibble with this idea that that the answer is the kind of like penury and having no resources creates better, more, you know, um, adventurous art. And I was like, well, there's some truth in that, but it becomes kind of obscene when it's when it's uh, when it's invoked by people who are running these like massive online platforms that are making totally. billions of dollars off of free content, like and when you're making when yeah. you're just making more work for yourself by having to like like yes, it's a great skill to have if you're thinking creatively about how to make the most of like the little resources that you have. But like, wouldn't it be great if you could just be thinking um, in broader terms, like broader than the confines that you have? It's just it's wild to me that other industries um, don't have to, well, perhaps they do, but I think a lot of, it, we were talking in the back about like, no one questions that a doctor should be paid, no one questions that a plumber should be, should be paid, this is something that we've all deemed as a service. Um, but there are still so many of us, even artists themselves, who claim that like, you shouldn't be paid for your art, you shouldn't be paid for these things that you're doing, and I think that that really devalues um, the work of, of people who are not just um, creating blank content, but like who are uh, exchanging ideas. Well, I think we've bought into this idea that work should be miserable. You know, that, that too. It, only, only miserable work deserves to be you compensated, to which is why those people who are miserable on Wall Street working their hedge fund jobs and working 90 hours a week should make millions and millions of dollars. Right. And to me, it's like what we pay what work is, what, how work is valued, how anything is valued is a social arrangement, it's a construct. And, you know, I've been asked by many people, well, you know, do artists deserve to make a living? And my reply is always, well, you know, who deserves to make a living? We all dis right. decide that. Who makes I mean, in that the determination? Yeah, and, and ultimately, in the book I mentioned a few times, just the idea of a guaranteed annual income, which is sort of an idea that uh, was actually first seriously advocated by Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> which shows really? you how far we've come as a as a society, but it is um, so sad. So much nostalgia for Nixon, but um, but yeah, it might be the way to go. I, but I think I think the question of you know of of creative labor and and value is it's like an endless wormhole, but endlessly yes, endlessly fascinating. And another thing you brought up backstage actually was this idea of you know that art should be done on, done on this volunteer basis has a kind of hidden class component. Maybe you want to. Totally, more. totally. I was, I was actually having a, um, a discussion on Twitter last week. Uh, a writer in Brooklyn was, wrote, uh, he works for Impose, he wrote this kind of like death of, of DIY music uh, essay on, on how Brooklyn has become totally gentrified and he sort of uh, addressed it to all other creatives living in Brooklyn saying like, this is your fault every time that you've gone to a sponsored show and, and had the free drinks and, you know, not invested in your own independent uh, art, not invested in, like, an independent magazine like mine and, and taken the money, taken the bait elsewhere. You've created this. Um, it's your fault. And I think, and he, he later said, like, I was kind of being playful with my, with my finger pointing. Um, but another woman I, I know who, who is an artist but also works for a branch of MTV uh, spoke up and said, you know, I used to write for you for free, for free, 
um, and I'm now paid by MTV and by other, by, by Rolling Stone, by these other um, institutions. How dare you point a finger at me when like, I'm, I'm trying to make a living. And there's a huge, there's a huge um, class component to making art independently and something that I think a lot of people, particularly in like punk and DIY don't consider, is that if you're able to say no to corporate money or sponsorships or things like that, that's, that's actually a huge privilege in and of itself to be able to, to make those concessions. Like I, I was talking with people about Vice Media buying up a, 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 an independent gallery space in Brooklyn recently and turning it into office space. And a few friends wrote me private messages and were like, I totally agree with you. I'm not gonna say that on Twitter because I am hoping that they're going to pay me to write an article for them at some point. And like, that's the reality that we live in. You know, it's uh, when we're depending on money like this, and a lot of us are, um, for survival so that we don't have to do work that has no relation to the work that we want to be doing. Um, we have to silence ourselves a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's funny for me, part of writing this book was figuring out my relationship to these institutions uh, because I, I come from a background where I was, I was unschooled, which is a radical anarchist kind of homeschooling. And it was like schools are jails, all institutions are corrupt you know, independent outsider ethos. And one thing I came to writing this was that, no, we need institutions, actually. We just need them to be more democratic and totally. accountable and just. And, you know, this is, I think, in the digital age, we've sort of put too much of our trust in these big platforms. I mean, this is, at least as an independent filmmaker, it was like, look, just, you know, do your thing and reach your audience through Facebook and build your friends and followers network. And, you know, we kind of abandoned all of our independent distributors and you know decided that okay these independent cinemas are going to be irrelevant in the future and I I was sort of looking at looking at our whole uh, landscape I was like no actually institutions are, are really important and things in offline space add so much I mean there are lots of studies that show this but add so much to our cultural diversity in terms of even just discovery um, you, are you saying really like, vital. like like creating and maintaining physical space. Yeah, for people. yeah, yeah, are really are, are, are so essential and kind of just got ignored for a few years as we were like rah rah internet rah rah. Did, did you say that you were raised by radical anarchists or that you that's like the background that you come from? Uh, no, yeah, that was like in in my uh, unschooling is is um, a radical version of homeschooling. It's like anarchist homeschooling. Okay, where you, you know the kids are you are your own teacher as a small child. No bedtimes. Wow. No mornings, no homework, wow, very no cool. shoes. I, I eventually went to school to see what it was like, and I could not, I just could barely wear my shoes for eight hours. I bet, I, like, I bet, that's, wow, <laughs> that's so interesting. So, that's, to, so for me to be like, institutions can be okay was a real, like, me really coming to like this middle, I mean, that's, middle ground. Uh, that, that <laughs> background of like, fuck all institutions is where I draw a lot of um, my ideas from, but at the same time, I'm trying to like, justify that at this point. Um, I feel like institutions have failed me and have failed a lot of people that I know throughout my entire life. Um, uh, but I'm trying to figure out now if, if there are ways that, like, is that a utopian idea that we can build these institutions that will take all of our voices into account, that won't, um, like, unfairly benefit some people and not others. We have, I think we have, an, do we have an end card here? Oh. Yeah, we, we, yeah. I knew this was gonna It's, it sucks, and I think about this a lot. It's, it's um, Spotify is so user-friendly, so I would never fault someone for using Spotify. Like, maybe all of you do. That's, I mean, if that's like an easy way for you to listen to music, 
more power to you. I fault um, the broken system that's created this tool that has like totally divorced me and other people who are making music from the income that you should be seeing from, from the easy access people have to listen to your music, so. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's advertisers, advertisers getting to ride on the backs of creativity, really, and um, uh, yeah, fuck Spotify, I think that that's true. I think there are other questions, too, that, I mean, uh, independent, you know, people, uh, independent label friends I've spoken to are really also worried about the way that Spotify is kind of hearing their concerns, you know, that people, like, you know, again, with this replication of the old model, so most listens go to a handful of songs that are put out by the big three record labels or whatever. So there's this problem of discovery. And so they're hearing these executives now speak to them in terms of like, oh yeah, I, you know, your problem is that you need to have your stuff be surfaced and basically it kind of hinting that there will be more kind of pale arrangements. I mean, the, you know, Barnes and Noble bookstores, the books are, that are in the front section are books that the, the publishers have paid a co-op fee for those books to be there. And the internet is just like that, only there's like one front page for Amazon and one front page for Spotify or whatever. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's advertising. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's advertisers and paying for placement. So again, it's like retrograde future. There's a section in the People's Platform about the sort of hidden charges on the internet, the idea that um, even when something is ostensibly free, you're paying in being exposed to advertising or data collection or something like that. And there's this phrase like a self-esteem tax, the idea or the implication that basically if you can't hack it on the level playing field of the internet, then like maybe you're not actually that good. I am curious about whether the two of you have like dealt with that feeling firsthand and what you've done to push through it. We were talking about this backstage a little bit, just this idea that um, everyone, like, where does this assumption come from that, like, the point of making your art is to, like, make it, whatever that means, like, being super famous or, or being super rich. And I don't think that, like, I mean, that would be great, you know, sign me up for that. But, um, <laughs> but I just, I mean, all I really want is to be able to like sustain myself and do the work that I want to do. And um, I don't see that necessarily as more of a possibility with a lot of the models that exist on the internet. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, when, I, I was reacting in a way to some sort of like web guru saying like, now that we have the internet, it's your fault if you don't make it. It's a meritocracy online. So I do like waste a lot of words this demolishing the idea that it's a meritocracy in a digital space and all the different ways I can do that. Um, but I think it's a question, like one interesting thing to think about is just the assumption that scale is always good, which is another way of saying that, you know, celebrity or fame is always good, right? Um, and so if you make a website, it can reach the entire world or, you know, you have a concept, it can spread over the entire globe. And, and, and I, I think challenging that idea of that, that scale should always be big, I think it's something important to do right now, like thinking that it's okay to make things that are smaller, that are local, to try to make a career that is like at the middle. And, and that, to me, echoes the problem of our entire economy, which is like one of bifurcation of growing inequality of these incredibly rich people and you know incredible poverty and we see it you know in the arts with starving artists versus like art stars and and this polarizing is something that um, we see we see everywhere and and digital technology exacerbates it in lots of ways that I explore in depth and that I'm thinking about even more um, so I think how to mitigate that Chris Anderson had this idea of the long tail that was really popular for years and years. Um, and I, I try to debunk that, and I instead uh, take this phrase, the missing middle, from this uh, political theorist who wrote a book called The Myth of Digital Democracy. I think the missing middle is really important in trying to not just valorize that space, but figure out how to bolster it is important. Um, and that's, yeah. such a, that's such a recurring theme uh, in, in all these discussions that we're having is this constant idea that like the onus is on you. It's your fault that things are going wrong. It's your fault if you hadn't, haven't made it. Um, it's your fault. It's, it's something, it's, it's, it's a critique that I have of, of the culture of recycling that we have in the USA is just like, 
um, it's your responsibility to do all these things, and it is, it totally is, but why aren't we holding um, big business more accountable for all of these things, and why aren't we yeah. um, pointing to the infrastructure that's like so obviously flawed, rather than our own faults? I think that's exactly right. I mean, it's a way broader cultural trend, which is that all responsibility is put on the individual, and we see that where, like, you know, going back to my work with occupying the Rolling Jubilee is that education is no longer a public good, it's individually debt financed. So you are investing in your education by taking out a loan and then that's your risk and so you have to pay it off. And does, you know, it, it causes you to have the sort of cost benefit analysis of education and we see that um, just the general stripping of benefits and security from all types of employment, not just creativity. I'm interested in the way the figure of the artist is invoked in all of these other realms and kind of used to justify that. So I, I have some quotes where it's like, Oh, you don't like yeah. working at the Apple store for $10 an hour? But, I love that but, part. You know, you're an artist. You work at the Apple store. It's not about the money. And so the ethos of the artist is really in demand in an economy where, you know, the, where employers don't want to pay your payroll taxes or give you any insurance or something it like that. It should be an honor to do this thing. Yeah. Like, you shouldn't be so concerned right. with making money. And so I want, I want the good parts of being an artist to spread, the autonomy, the dignity, the... the um, non-alienation, the sense that you have, con you know, control over your work, those good aspects of being a creative person that I'd like to see spread, and not the precarity and the insecurity, um, you know, which are, are really dominant in our society right now. So I think we're, we're spreading the bad aspects of the, the creative lifestyle and not the good ones. We're getting our, our, our over. card here. <laughs> Thank um, you. Thank you for having Katie. us. Thank you so much.